Hi, it's October the 12th, 2019. Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, just a few quick words on a major fighter in boxing. If you've ever fallen down a flight of stairs, you never look at a flight of stairs the same way again, right? You realize the risk. Those stairs you used to jump two or three or four at a time when you're coming down the stairs, now suddenly you realize that one bad step could cause you injury. Right? Let's be real here. You don't need broken bones to have soft tissue injury, to suddenly develop things like a trick elbow, to suddenly start asking yourself, gee, do I even want to take the staircase again? Is it worth it to me? How much risk am I going to take on? Now, Errol Spence just got in a life-altering car crash in my eyes. Right? Maybe he didn't get any broken bones, but I'm sure he's looking at the car, he's looking at the damage, he's looking at what could have happened, he's looking at himself in the mirror. You know, a lot of the damage is mental. It's in how it changes your view of the world. Right? I'm sorry, but I just don't believe that Errol Spence should fight anybody over the next 8 to 12 months, no matter how much it costs him. Quite frankly, if I were Errol Spence, and Errol Spence has made some money, I would ask myself whether I want to continue fighting. He's unbeaten. He's been on a great run. Understand, to continue to have the kind of reputation and status that Errol Spence has, it's going to require that he continue to take on top flight opposition like Sean Porter in a very tough fight, like Mikey Garcia who was unbeaten at the time. Right? Errol Spence before the car crash was talking about Danny Garcia, he was talking about Manny Pacquiao, he was talking about Terence Crawford. Right? I'm just telling you that if a fight is announced involving Errol Spence in the next, oh, let's say four or five months. I'm going to look hard at it and I might bet against him. Because I just feel that these car crashes, even if you're able to walk away from them without broken bones, I believe these car crashes leave scar tissue. If not physical scar tissue, mental scar tissue. Boxers want to convince you that they're Superman, right? Didn't Adonna Stevenson call himself Superman? I'm just telling you that they're human like the rest of us. If your next door neighbor was a great athlete with a great left hook, he might be a boxer. Right? Bottom line is this. Errol Spence suffered the kind of major car accident that would have many of us taking Uber for the next year. Right? That's not the state of mind, in my opinion, that's conducive to getting back in the ring right away, or even dealing with sparring partners right away. I think that's the kind of thing that makes you want to take a step back and think about your life. I don't think Errol Spence at this stage is ready to fight again anytime soon. And if he steps in the ring with Pacquiao or Crawford, I'll be taking his opponent. Let's shift gears. Now I know there are many out there who believe in the idea of bigger, faster, stronger. Right? I have a lot of friends who are heavily into track and field. And the idea in track and field is that today's sprinter Today's Usain Bolt is better than the older version, right? The Ben Johnson, the Carl Lewis, right? The Jim Hines. We want to believe that the 
athletes today are just better than they used to be. This is the crowd that believes that Jim Brown would have a hard time rushing for 1,000 yards in a season in today's NFL. Right? Now, my point to you is simply, there's a different point of view out there. Right? Mark Twain put it best. He said, history doesn't always repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. Now, I'll just say, in boxing, we're in a stage of the heavyweight division that looks like it's inevitable. Right? You have Anthony Joshua Giant. Right? What is he? 6'6? Six, six. You have DeAndre. Tay Wilder, Giant. What is he? 6'7"? You have Tyson Fury. He's something like 6'9". You're in a heavyweight era of big muscles. Right? Anthony Joshua looks like he's straight out of a weightlifting class. Right? A bodybuilding class. You have big muscles. You have big punches. You have guys who don't even throw a lot of volume. They're just there to take you out, right? Deontay Wilder has literally KO'd every man he has faced. That's the era we're in right now. Now, I know the bigger, stronger, faster crowd wants you to believe that this is inevitable. Right, that this is where the evolution of the heavyweight division has taken us. Right, that this is the present, the future is going to have even bigger, stronger, and faster men. Right, but understand that's not history. Boxing isn't track and field. Right, boxing is cyclical. Things run in cycles. So you have the Galveston giant, Jack Johnson. You have Jess Willard. All of these guys, huge men for the day. And who's the conqueror of Jess Willard? It's Jack Dempsey. A smaller man, more agile. Using things like speed, movement. Volume. You have Joe Lewis, longest reigning heavyweight champion in history. He faces Ezra Charles, guy who was a former light heavyweight. And of course, Lewis loses because Charles has too much speed, too much movement, too much volume. Add in defense. Right? You had Sonny Liston, who Joe Lewis was calling the best heavyweight in history. Joe Lewis, by the way, is actually on the telecast of favorite Liston's fight against Cassius Clay, a guy who was a big underdog, but a guy who had speed, a guy who had movement a guy who had volume. So what we have right now is a period of time, in my opinion, that feels like a few hours before Pearl Harbor. Let's face it, the guys at the top of the heavyweight division, one man's opinion, look to have flaws. Deontay Wilder was on his back foot in the first Bermain Stavern fight. You notice if you look at the film, he has a pretty good jab. You notice he can actually fight off his back foot. He does in that fight, which goes a distance. But what you also notice is that that fight goes the distance. Right? He KOs Stavern in the rematch. So he literally has KO'd every man he's faced. But understand that fight goes the distance and raises the question. Can Deontay Wilder box 
and hit you with power shots at the same time? Or is it the kind of thing where if you get him moving, does his power leave the ring? The vast majority of fights Deontay Wilder wins are right hand KOs. He's flat footed. He's not moving. It's all or nothing. You notice some of the guys he's fought move a little bit and keep him off balance for several rounds. Revisit the Arthur Spielka fight. Right? Spielka, quite frankly, has Wilder confused at times. That fight makes it into the second half of the fight. Let's talk about Anthony Joshua. A lot of muscles, a lot of size, absolutely clueless, completely unprepared for hand speed and volume. Looks as unprepared as a fighter could look against Andy Ruiz. Has limited survival skills. Once he starts hitting the canvas, folks, he's hitting the canvas multiple times. You didn't get the feeling after that disastrous third round. You didn't get the feeling in the last round of that fight that Anthony Joshua had learned anything between the third round and the last round of the fight. He's as clueless against Andy Ruiz in the last round of the fight as he is in the third round. One wonders, at least I wonder, how he's even favored in the rematch, much less a big enough favorite where this gambler's getting better than 200 on uh, Andy Ruiz, plus 200, plus 250. Let's talk about Andy Ruiz. Right? Ruiz is interesting because he isn't a giant. Andy's actually bringing hand speed to the party, isn't he? Fastest hands in the heavyweight division. He's bringing combinations to the party. Right? You don't see combinations, do you, from Wilder or Joshua? Andy's bringing combinations to the party. But then you notice that Andy's not a movement guy, is he? Back foot? What's that? Right? Andy's not a guy who dances. He's not up on the balls of his feet. Right? Doesn't really move backwards. Doesn't really move around the ring. As well as, let's say, a Dempsey, a Charles, or an Ali. Right? Andy's style is made to beat giants like Anthony Joshua. You get the feeling against an Ali, a guy who can move around the ring, Andy might not be able to keep up. Andy's hand speed would be wasted on the outside, at the edge of Ali's jab, unable to land on Ali. Let's talk about Tyson Fury. Wow. Fury doesn't quite seem to be who he was, does he? Against Vladimir Klitschko. Let's face it, Fury got hit hard by Deontay Wilder. I thought Fury won the fight. But Fury gets hit hard in that 12th round, doesn't he? Wilder lands the punch flush doesn't he? In fact, Wilder lands with the right hand, then as Fury's going down, Wilder steps up, hits him with the left hand. You wonder, gee, is this the guy who had his hands behind his back against Klitschko? Is this, is this the Fury who's prime Fury? Who is going through fights, fighting left-handed, against Kevin Johnson, for example? Or is this a version of Fury who is still coming back from having his body go from him? Right? Gain a lot of weight. Uh, is still coming back from his personal demons. Wasn't he hit quite a few times by Otto Wallen? Right? Doesn't Valen actually land several punches? You didn't get the feeling in that fight that Fury had the confidence to stay away from Valen. 
Granted, the cut has a lot to do with it, but the bottom line is, right, Fury makes a decision to come inside on Valen. Right? I get the feeling that Fury isn't quite back. The reflexes still look dim to me. So, as I see it, the heavyweight division is vulnerable. I believe we're at a turning point here. Right? I've been saying here for years that I believe top cruiserweights were going to invade the heavyweight division. I believe we've just come to accept things that aren't true. The idea that to be competitive, a heavyweight has to weigh what Anthony Joshua weighs, right? Or what Andy Ruiz weighs, up around 250, right? What Tyson Fury weighs before fights. We forget that there's a whole group of elite heavyweights, and I mean elite heavyweights, who weighed much less than that. One of the biggest fights in history, the fight between Ali and Fraser, the first fight. Look at the weights, folks. You're gonna gasp. So here you have one of the world's best fighters. Now understand, speed, movement, and volume is just one of the styles this guy has. If Alexander Usyk wants, he can try to walk you down. But I believe in this heavyweight division, he would find that the style that would lead him to beat Anthony Joshua, I'd take Usyk over Joshua. Deontay Wilder, I'd take Usyk over Deontay Wilder. Right? The, the style that would give him the edge against both is one where he keeps the fight outside and moves. Right? He does what Tyson Fury does for most of the fight against Deontay Wilder only with a little bit more volume. Then when the opportunity presents itself comes inside. I think the heavyweight division is about to be invaded. Understand, Maris Breedis already KO'd, cold, knocked him out cold. Manuel Char. I believe Breedis and Usyk are simply too fast in terms of movement and boxing ability than some of the guys who rule the roost right now at heavyweight. So it starts today. Usyk somehow is getting paid to fight 38-year-old Chaz Witherspoon. A guy who in two of his last three fights fought guys who did not have winning records. Witherspoon might weigh 20 pounds more than Usyk, who weighs what a traditional heavyweight weighs, right around 215. Right, but understand, Witherspoon views himself as a cerebral fighter. Right, so Witherspoon is not going to impose his weight on Usyk. Witherspoon isn't going to have the mindset of, hey, you're a new heavyweight. <coughs> Welcome to the heavyweight division. Here's the extra weight you're dealing with. He's not going to come in like George Foreman, lean on him. Right? Have, have a dynamic where the big man is throwing his weight around. No, that's not who Witherspoon is. Witherspoon is going to make the mistake of trying to fight Usyk on his back foot. Witherspoon's going to make the mistake of trying to be patient against Usyk. Right now, I'm just telling you, Usyk's hardest fight to date was against Maris Breedis. I believe those two guys are going to intersect again in the future, only at heavyweight. This Witherspoon fight is a complete mismatch. 
I'm expecting Usyk to make a statement here. I think Usyk is just too fast for Chaz Witherspoon, who was KO'd early years ago by Seth Mitchell, who was disqualified early against Chris Ariola. Looking at the film, it looks to me that Witherspoon's defense degrades in the middle of a combination. In other words, if you come up and you start throwing a few punches, Witherspoon might block the first one. But then he has problems with the second, third, and fourth. Now understand Usyk, one of the world's best fighters, an Olympic gold medalist who's unbeaten who is fighting the best fighters out there, who was not unified. He was undisputed at cruiserweight, had all the major titles. Just understand that he is a jack of all trades. If he needs to be a combination puncher against you, that's who he's going to be. I think Usyk makes a statement I think Usyk wins this fight by stoppage. I don't think a guy who has been fighting sub-500 fighters recently deserves to be in the ring with Alexander Usyk. I just don't think Witherspoon is fast enough to hang with Usyk. I think Usyk is aware of the fact that this guy has been rocked in some fights. That this guy is several years older than Usyk. I think Usyk makes a statement, quite frankly, as I see it. I know this is Usyk's debut at heavyweight. As I see it, Usyk is ready for the very best at heavyweight. I take prime Tyson Fury over him, right? The million dollar question is how far from prime is current Tyson Fury, right? I believe Usyk is better off fighting the Deontay Wilders of the world, the guys who are primarily KO punchers, who rely on KOing you rather than outpointing you on the scorecards than he is taking on more athletic fighters like let's say a Joseph Parker. Right? I think Usyk is a major threat. I believe this is the tip of the iceberg. I think the pendulum is going to swing back away from 6'7 and 6'6 six, six heavyweights. More toward shorter heavyweights who weigh let's say 210 to 225, right? It's going to swing away from the heavier guys who are there trying to KO you back toward the guys who try to outbox you. I'm just telling you, years ago, you would watch a heavyweight fight and you just assume just assumed that the heavyweight knew how to dance. Right? You just assumed that every heavyweight understood that many of these fights were going to go the distance. So you had guys like Tony Tucker, for example, who had a gear where he could be up on his toes and jab you and outbox you. He understood he might not be able to take you out. You had guys like Tony Tubbs, another guy who could get light on his feet and who could box with you. Now that changed when a cat quick guy who was under six feet, Mike Tyson, showed up and started hunting these guys down. Started KOing these fighters. Right? Then we get to the Lennox Lewis era, and suddenly you have heavyweights who were bigger than they were in the past. That dovetails into the 
Vitaly, Vitaly Klitschko era, where you suddenly have big guys who are monumental, don't move that much, but who have jabs. Right, well that's led us to where we are now, but you got a hint of what's been missing from the heavyweight division when Tyson Fury, in one of the more important fights in recent memory, beat Vladimir Klitschko. Right, that fight's more important than the Joshua fight to me, simply because, style-wise, you noticed that Klitschko was unprepared. And this was Klitschko as champion. Klitschko was unprepared to deal with Tyson Fury's movement behind a jab. Tyson Fury's moving around, he's faking punches. Klitschko is frozen. Klitschko does next to nothing for most of that fight. I believe Usyk is going to bring that back to the heavyweight division. Right? If Tyson Fury is clever. If he's smart, he stays away from Usyk for a while while he shakes off the cobwebs on his own game. Right? Otto Wallen literally comes within a doctor's decision of winning the heavyweight title. Right? Fury's badly cut. Badly cut. The cut's caused by a punch. Had the doctor in that fight said, up, oh, that's it, Otto Wallen would be the heavyweight champion. Right? We need to come to grips with that. Let's just play this out. If an upset happens, if Luis Ortiz, who I'll concede, would be a difficult matchup for Usyk, if Luis Ortiz upsets Deontay Wilder, and that's a distinct possibility, folks, I think the odds are out of whack on that fight. If he upsets Deontay Wilder, if I'm Tyson Fury, I don't rush to fight him, even though I just fought a lefty in, in Otto Wallet. I don't rush to fight Ortiz, simply because Ortiz is too crafty and he's a southpaw. Right? I would try to regain confidence in my ability to dance. Understand, he would have beaten Wilder. Hindsight's 100%, I'll agree. But he would have beaten Wilder if he just stayed away in the 12th round. As it was, he gets drilled in the 12th round, loses the 12th round, and all three judges score cards, and ends up with a draw. Right, so Fury, Freddie Roach is in the corner in that fight, telling Fury, hey, go inside, go inside. Right, Fury listens to his younger trainer, not the future Hall of Fame trainer in his corner. Right, Fury doesn't seem to me to be comfortable, either in his ability to stay away for 12 rounds or in his ability to come inside against heavy hitters. Let's face it, Valen, who he comes inside against, and Schwartz, who he comes inside against, don't hit as hard as Deontay Wilder. So if you get one takeaway from this video, make it this. The heavyweight division right now is vulnerable. You have a highly skilled former undisputed cruiserweight champion about to invade the division. And as I see it from this seat, he's looking at less opposition than you think. Right? One of the most dangerous fighters to him might actually be the cruiserweight who's in the WBSS Cruiserweight Finals against Dordikos. Right? If Maris Breedis wins that fight, and I think he does, then look for him to also travel to the heavyweight division because in my eyes, he's a bigger threat to Usyk than, let's say, Anthony Joshua would be. 
Now, I know many of you are going to disagree with me. Certainly, casinos do, right? Joshua somehow is a favorite against Andy Ruiz in the rematch. I understand the betting lines don't line up with anything I've said. That's okay. I'll take my chances. Let me hear from you, though. Give me your thoughts. I believe this is the start of Pearl Harbor. 2019, figuratively speaking, on the heavyweight division, right? I think this fantasy of 6'6 six, six, and 6'7 six, guys ruling the roost with low volume and a lot of power, right? I just don't think that's sustainable. I think we're going to get back to a Jack Dempsey, an Ezra Charles, right? Um, smaller guys, a Rocky Marciano. A guy who really wasn't a master boxer, but was a big puncher who could fight low. Give tall guys a hard time. Right? Put a different way, in a sense, we're in the Jack Johnson, Jess Willard era. Right? We're in the Primo Carnera, Joe Lewis era. Right? I believe we're going to get back to an era where instead of focusing on a fighter's power at heavyweight, we're focusing on the fighter's movement and the fighter's hand speed, timing, volume. That's how I see it. I expect a big win today for Usyk. That's how I see it. Let me say this too on the undercard. I know everyone's looking at the big light heavyweight fight between Canelo and um, Kovalev. On the undercard of the Usyk fight, you have a guy, Bivol, who might be the best at 175 pounds. Take a look at him. You're going to see there a lot of volume, movement, timing. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.